All right. So those are our inhibitors. Um, why do they matter? Uh, from a biological perspective, there's um, we actually use inhibitors a lot in everyday life. So enzyme inhibitors. A lot of toxins and poisons when we're trying to kill something, basically um, like things we don't want in our house, insects, rodents, that kind of stuff, or eating our crops, basically. Uh, we use these enzyme inhibitors. So if you've heard of DDT, which we don't use in the US anymore because it actually affected human um, react, uh, enzy enzymatic reactions as well. So it harmed humans. Um, ideally, these inhibitors just act on the specific organism we wanna kill, say a cockroach or something like that. But these inhibitors um, that are toxins and poisons will basically keep key enzymes from working in these uh, in the organisms' bodies that we kind of want to get rid of. So parathion is a really common pesticide these days, as well as DEET. So we have DEET now, which is not harmful, usually, to humans. <laughs> um, so yeah, pesticides are a good example of where we use inhibitors in everyday life. And also, very importantly, antibiotics. So if you've ever taken an antibiotic like penicillin, that will, penicillin specifically, inhibits the development of a cell wall in bacteria. So antibiotics only work against bacteria. They don't work against viruses because bacteria need these cell walls to actually survive. So by essentially inhibiting the enzyme that can build, help build these cell walls, you're keeping the bacteria from being able to reproduce and survive successfully. So enzyme inhibition is really important from a human standpoint beyond just the process of like respiration. Okay, so those are a couple of real world examples. And, oh yeah, cofactors. So the cofactors are basically little helpers for the enzymes. So typically non-protein helpers, but um, in general, they're gonna help the enzyme work better or work in general. So some enzymes need them period, some they just work more efficiently if they have the cofactor. So here we have, so this, the protein here is gonna be um, the enzyme. Cause like I said, all enzymes for our purposes are essentially proteins. You have the cofactor binding to it, that's gonna activate it. So in this case, without the cofactor binded to it, it's not actually gonna be effective all on its own. So it needs a little helper. And then from there, the substrate can bind to the, the cofactor specifically, which will allow the reaction to take place. So this is sort of probably kind of abstract for you, but a lot of vitamins that you need in your diet are cofactors. So like vitamin A is a really important cofactor to help your body process certain materials. Vitamin D, all those good vitamins. So vitamins are a really good example of a cofactor. They're not an enzyme themselves, but they help the enzymes to work better in our bodies. All right, I think that wraps up this section, that chapter. Yep, okay, leave that up in case you guys didn't quite get it all. So that wraps up sort of our intro to get us ready for respiration and photosynthesis. That was a lot of intro material. And that. All right. Oh, so I should say, I don't think I've said this in here. For those of you, so I see some people on Zoom who are supposed to be in class. And if you're on Zoom and you're supposed to be in class, I have to mark you as absent basically. So just keep that in mind as you're kind of planning your day. I know it gets confusing trying to figure out when you have to be here and when you're not and your other classes may be different. But if you're supposed to be in class, um, from now on and you're on Zoom, unless you have like a doctor's appointment or something and you tell me about it, um, 
then I'll have to mark you as absent. Just FYI. Okay. So what is this week? This is a gold week, right? Yeah. So we're at the kind of last half of the alphabet this week. Okay. So we're jumping into some of the hardest material this semester. Come on. Okay. So cellular, cellular respiration is probably one of the harder chapters to understand and grasp. So I'm gonna try to sort of take my time going through it, ask questions as we go. Um, like with a lot of the other stuff, I've kind of cut it down to, I think the most important pieces that I want you guys to know. So you generally understand this aspect of biology. Um, so this lecture, this PowerPoint file that's on Canvas is actually just kind of the first, really the first step of cellular respiration. So there's three steps. So I split it into two separate PowerPoint files, not that you necessarily care, but this will kind of get into um, the first step of cellular, cellular respiration. And then we'll finish it on fr Wednesday and Friday. Okay, so let's do a little, some kind of intro, some reminders, hopefully, um, about respiration versus photosynthesis. So these are the two topics we'll be talking about until the next exam. Um, I've mentioned this plenty of times before, but photosynthesis is making glucose. So does that make it, so it's a reaction, photosynthesis and respiration are just chemical reactions happening. Does that make it an endergonic or exergonic reaction if it's building glucose? Endergonic. Yes, endergonic. <laughs> so it's endergonic, it's using energy to build this big glucose molecule. So photosynthesis is making glucose using energy. Respiration is just the opposite. So it's breaking down glucose. So it's exergonic and releasing energy. And just as a reminder, energy, it's a one-way flow through a system. It doesn't get recycled. So one-way flow of energy from, say, the plants that are initially taking up the sun's energy all the way up, you know, through the, um, the trophic levels, the food web, food chain, however you want to think of it, it's a one-way flow. Chemicals are recycled over and over. So by chemicals, mostly what I'm talking about, what we'll focus on here is carbon. So um, I'll show you, I think I mentioned the, the molecular formula for um, glucose, but glucose has basically a chain of six carbons in it. And we're gonna be counting those carbons um, to see kind of where they go during respiration, as well as looking at the energy that is uh, produced or in the case of photosynthesis uh, used. Okay, so chemicals get recycled. When, it, when, you, when I say chemicals, think carbon, um, and then energy just moving through the system. Okay, so those are some of the main points you definitely want to uh, remember as we go through this stuff. Okay, so an overview of respiration. Like I said, this gets into biochemistry. So it's chemistry from a biological perspective, which can get a little intimidating when we have something that looks like this, right? A reaction, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 leads to that stuff. So I'm gonna to try to break it down so you guys recognize what these molecules are and know why they're important, where they come from and kind of where they go to. So the whole goal of respiration, and when I say respiration for our purposes, we're talking about at the cellular, cellular level, that's really hard for me to say, <laughs> cellular. I'm not talking about breathing, like respiration. I'm talking about a cell breaking down glucose and uh, making energy from that or releasing energy. So the whole goal of respiration is to break down food and release energy.
we're going to be focusing on glucose. Obviously, you eat more than glucose. So glucose is a carbohydrate. Hopefully, you guys don't just eat carbohydrates. You're also eating proteins and fats, right? Um, nucleic acids, we're not really going to think about. So I'll talk about that one brief slide at the very end of this respiration chapter. I'll talk about, yes, we also break down fats and proteins. It happens, they come into the cycle at kind of different parts, but we're gonna focus on glucose. If you understand how glucose is broken down and used in respiration, I'll be happy with that. So our food is glucose. This is the molecular formula for glucose, C6H12O6. You want to memorize that. So there's six carbons, there's 12 hydrogens, and there's six oxygens. So two times the number of hydrogens for compared to the carbon and the oxygen. And down here, I've written what each of these are just in, in, word, in, in English. Yeah, I guess English, not chemistry speak. So here we have glucose. We're gonna add six molecules of oxygen. So you do wanna, um, I want you to memorize this uh, uh, reaction that's being shown here, including how many of each molecule there are. It's either basically, if we ignore ATP right here, it's one or six of all of these. So we're always starting with one glucose molecule for this reaction when we're talking about it. Um, in this class. So we're assuming we're going to start with one glucose molecule. That's what we base all this off of. So one glucose molecule here, we have to add six oxygen molecules. And then once those come together, and a lot of stuff happens that we're going to talk about, <laughs> when those come together, the result is that we release six carbon dioxides. So we're releasing carbon dioxide as a waste product. We're also releasing water as a waste product. So six waters. And then the main goal of this whole process, like I said, is to make energy, which is ATP. So we're gonna make 36 ATP. So if we start with one glucose molecule, we end with 36 ATP. You might see other numbers here because it's a range. It's usually like, what is it 34 to 36 ATP, I think. In order to simplify things, we're just gonna say 36. Let's just remember 36. But if you come across something that starts to explain why there might be different ATP, feel free to dig into it, but I'm not gonna ask you guys to know it. All right, so one glucose molecule results in the release of 36 ATPs. And I know you don't really have a sense of what that is or what that means, but um, yeah, we'll kind of get into that. All right, so that's our respiration reaction. The reactants here and then the products over here. Okay. The three steps to respiration. So that reaction happens over three fairly complicated steps. <laughs> if we break them down and just name them, we have glycolysis happening first. Then we have something called the citric acid cycle. It has two names. It's also called the Krebs cycle. So you'll see both of those. I'll ask you to know both of those. Um, there's a lot of pieces of biology where we have multiple names for things. It's annoying, but when they're still used, when both of them are still used interchangeably, I typically um, ask you guys to know them. So citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle, same thing. And then we have oxidative phosphorylation. So that sounds really complicated, but that's the last step. The vast majority of the ATP that we're making is made in this last step. So the first, the first step makes a little bit, and then second step makes a little more, and then oxidative phosphorylation is where we get a ton of ATP made. All right. 
So now we're going to run through, not run through, we're going to slowly walk through these three steps and kind of look at a little bit of detail at what is happening in each of these steps. It's important to know where these occur. So, okay, we're inside one cell right now. This big yellow blob is a mitochondrion. So the mitochondria are where a ton of energy is made, right? Those are the energy centers of the cell. This process, glycolysis, actually starts outside the mitochondria, just in the cytoplasm of the cell. So that's the only part that happens in the cytoplasm, the very first step. Then we move into the mitochondrion, and that's where the rest of it happens. So. This diagram is kind of showing the different steps. So we have glycolysis, citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. Citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation are happening in the mitochondrion. And here you can see the ATP that are being made. And here I have, that's annoying, I meant to fix that. So here we don't have 36 ATP, we have 38, right? That's annoying. <laughs> so um, I'll go back and fix that, but we're, we're gonna sum up and say there's a total of 36 ATP. So you have a little bit of ATP made in glycolysis, a little bit in the citric acid cycle and a ton in oxidative phosphorylation. So this is why the mitochondria are the energy centers of the cells because we have so much ATP being made at the very end of respiration. Okay. So glycolysis is happening in the cytoplasm. Yeah, so a couple, a few really important molecules that we need to talk about that are playing a huge part in respiration. We have carbon, carbon's critical. We're all carbon-based organisms. Um, like I said, and you just saw, uh, glucose has six carbons in it. So carbon is critical. We're gonna account for the carbon um, as we move through respiration. Because glucose is gonna be broken down. So we're gonna make sure we don't lose any of that carbon basically, right? We're not losing the chemicals, we're keeping them and recycling them. ATP is obviously really important. Hopefully that diagram of ATP looks pretty familiar. And then something new that you have not heard of yet, um, NAD plus or NADH. So this is another molecule. I'm not gonna have you look at the structure of it at all. I'm not even gonna tell you what the, what the initials stand for. You don't need to know it. NAD plus or NADH, just think of them as a little electron shuttle. So we're gonna move electrons around in respiration. And this is the molecule that will do it. So I'll talk more about that when we get into the process, but think of NAD plus, which will turn into NADH. It'll go back and forth, whether there's an H or not on it. That's our electron shuttle. That's how we're moving electrons around, which is very important. And then enzymes. So you guys are familiar with enzymes. Enzymes play a role. Like I said, I'm not gonna require you to know the different categories of enzymes. Just know that they're, I think, I think I mentioned that enzymes are needed at each stage, but enzymes are needed throughout this process. Whether I mentioned them or not, they are an integral part of this whole process. So without enzymes, if you have some kind of inhibitor that's inhibiting your enzymes, um, it's gonna cause major issues with respiration. So major issues with making ATP. So your cells will not have energy. Okay, so those are our four main pieces or molecules, I guess, of respiration. All right, <laughs> so I was looking, so now we're gonna talk about glycolysis. Um, when I was making the slide, I, I think I Googled a uh, simple diagram for glycolysis <laughs> and this is what popped up. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, how, is that, how does that come up under simple diagram of glycolysis? But I left it up here because I want you to know it's a complicated process and there's so much biochemistry that goes into it, but you don't need to know 
you don't need to know all of the details to understand what's happening. So I want you guys to understand generally what's happening. So I'm going to break it down, I think, into basically two different steps. So we're going to seriously cut out a lot of this information, but know that I have simplified it in a lot of ways. Okay. So glycolysis, remember, we're out. We're not in the mitochondria yet. We're in the cytoplasm. That's just a reminder. So what we're doing in glycolysis is we're splitting glucose down, and we're going to end up with something called pyruvate. And I'll show you in a very simple way how that's done without having to go through all 10 of those steps that I just showed you on the previous slide. So glucose to pyruvate, that's what's happening in glycolysis. I think I've mentioned in here that whenever you see lysis, it means something's splitting. So glycolysis or glycolysis is the splitting of sugar or glucose. What's happening is um, the six carbon molecule of glucose is being split into two, three carbon molecules. So you can almost imagine it as being cut in half. There's a lot of other stuff, as you saw on that previous slide, that happens to it. But we're essentially slicing glucose in half. So you have two pyruvate molecules, each of which have three carbons. So we haven't lost any carbons. They're still all there. They're just kind of rearranged. I said this eight times already. It occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. And I've simplified it into, simplified it as much as possible, into two major phases. So you have the first part of glycolysis, where we're splitting this glucose molecule. Um, energy is actually needed. So we have to invest energy first. And then there's a little bit of payoff. So we invest some ATP and then we get some ATP out. That's the energy investment phase and the energy payoff phase. And if you're interested, there's 10 total steps in glycolysis, um, five in the energy investment phase and five in the energy payoff phase. Okay. A really important point here is that glycolysis occurs with or without the presence of oxygen. And you might be thinking, why does that matter? So we did say, if you remember back to the respiration reaction, we had glucose plus oxygen. Those were the two reactants that were needed to make this happen. For this first step, glycolysis, we don't need the oxygen yet. That comes later at the end, basically. This will come into play when we talk about um, fermentation. So fermentation does not require oxygen. It's just glucose or glycolysis happening over and over again. I'll talk about that in um, uh, probably on Wednesday. We might get to it today. OK, just remember, glycolysis doesn't need oxygen. That doesn't come in until later. But it's really important. For respiration, we need oxygen. If we stop breathing, everything shuts down because our cells can't produce any more ATP, right? If we're not taking in oxygen, we can't actually do respiration. And it requires enzymes, yeah. So like I said, requires enzymes. I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. Okay, so the energy investment phase. We are investing energy in order to make energy. And this is where um, we're splitting glucose, that six carbon molecule, into two, three carbon molecules, but not pyruvate yet. You don't have to know the name of the molecule. Well, it's cut off here, but um, 
It's called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or G3P. You don't need to know that name, just know this first part, glucose is split in half. This is kind of, I should have raised this up. Um, this is a simplified version of it. So in these diagrams, we're kind of ignoring, there's obviously in glucose, there's uh, hydrogens and oxygens as well, but we're just gonna not worry about them when we're counting the carbons as we go through this process. So glucose, we start out with six carbons. We're gonna end down here with two, three carbon molecules. So here for you guys on Zoom, we have this six carbon glucose, split it and you get two, three carbon molecules. Oh, whoops. Okay, do I have that? Hang on. Okay, so here um, it uses two ATP. So that's the one part I didn't mention. So we haven't lost any carbon. We're using two ATP molecules. So that's what this is. You'll see a lot of these kinds of arrows. So two ATP is going in and two ADP are coming out. That means ATP has been used. So we've chopped off one of those phosphate groups. So instead of having three phosphates on ATP, now we just have two. And that released a little bit of energy to use to make this happen, to make this split possible. Those phosphates get attached down here. So those PIs, those are the phosphates that came off the ATPs. So we have two ATPs, one phosphate group from one of those is going to one of these three carbon molecules. The other phosphate from the other ATP molecule is going to the other three carbon molecule. Okay, so two ATPs are used. That's the take home message. All right, and then we go into the energy payoff phase. Now we have these three carbon molecules which, with the little phosphates attached now, so that G3P. And that's basically just gonna get rearranged and those phosphates are gonna come off. So we put the phosphate on, again, there's a lot that happens in between here. We put the phosphate on, then we take it off. Um, and you end up with two pyruvates at the end of glycolysis. So you just have these two three carbon molecules. No carbon is lost. So we're just moving from three carbon molecule to three carbon molecule. This is gonna make four ATP. So we're basically taking these phosphate groups off of here in this intermediate step and adding it back to ADP to make ATP. So here as well. Okay, and now, so four ATP totals made, no carbon is lost. I've if these are helpful to you for understanding, by all means, look at them. If they're not, and you'd rather just kind of memorize the bullet points, the important stuff is written here in the bullet points. This is what I want you guys to know. So no carbon lost, we've made four ATP. We used two, but we made four. So we have a net of two, right? At the end of glycolysis. All right, now this NAD stuff, this new molecule that we haven't really talked about, but remember, it's an electron shuttle, it's just moving electrons around, it's its whole purpose. Um, we need electrons to move from this stage to basically the very last stage for a really important part of respiration. So we're kind of collecting electrons, holding on to them on the NADH, and then moving them to the very last step of respiration. So that starts here, where we, add an electron in the form of an, a hydrogen atom. So we have a really tiny periodic table over there, but hydrogen has one proton and one electron. So the H that gets added here is essentially an electron. So this is our electron getting added. 
So now we have this molecule that's holding on to an electron, NADH, and it will transport it to where it needs to be eventually, to be continued, kind of. We'll get to that in a while. <laughs> I didn't talk much, or I don't think I talked at all in here about um, oxidation reduction reactions. Really all you need to know about this process, so these terms are kind of important, oxidation and reduction. And I'll do a review of this on Wednesday, but we say that NAD plus, that initial molecule, is reduced when we add an electron to it. So if you add an electron to something, it's reduced. Why is it reduced if you're adding something to it? You're adding an electron, which is negatively charged, right? So its charge is reduced. We went from a plus to a neutral. So the charge actually goes down. That's why it's called reduced. Um, oxidation is just the opposite. You lose an electron. So if NADH went to NAD plus, that would be oxidation. And we'll look at that later on too. So yeah, on Wednesday, I'll talk more about that, but this is, I just wanted to kind of go through this process and then we'll kind of revisit that idea on Wednesday. All right. So those are the main parts of the last part, the energy payoff phase of glycolysis. So this is our end point for glycolysis, two pyruvate molecules. And they have, you know, again, carbons and hydrogens coming off of here, but we're going to ignore those. We're just worried about how many carbons there are moving through this process. Okay. So here it is all put together. Um, C6H12O6, one molecule of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate, that is glycolysis. So from that crazy complicated slide that I showed you with 10 different steps, kind of boiled it down to the two, two main categories of steps, that energy investment and the energy payoff phase. And here you can see those two diagrams put together where we started with glucose, we go to these intermediate three carbon molecules, and then we end up with pyruvate at the bottom. And that's glycolysis in a very simplified sense. I know it's still a lot to take in and to understand. Um, but like I said, those bullet points that I have on the slides are what I want you guys to know. If it helps you to kind of understand the process a little more conceptually, by all means, um, I can tell you more or these diagrams might help you a little bit more rather than just memorizing those bullet points. But that's what I'll ask you about. Okay, so for... I think for all of these steps, yeah, for all these steps in respiration, um, we're going to account for the different molecules that are being made and used. So we want to keep up with ATP, how much ATP is being made at each stage, how much NADH is being made. I haven't talked about FADH2, but it's essentially the same as NADH. It's another electron shuttle. It plays a more minor role, but we'll keep up with that as well. I can't really ignore it, um, but I'm not really going to talk about it in any more detail. Just the, the ADHs are the, the electron shuttles. And then I also will have a column for other output. So each time we add the next stage, so the citric acid cycle, I'll have another part to this chart. And we'll just kind of continue to account for these different molecules that are being made or used. All right. So first, all we've gone through is glycolysis here. So we have glycolysis. Remember, we made four ATP, but used two. So our net is two. So we used two in the first stage, we made four. So total ATP made, that's the important number, um, is two. We also made two NADHs. Haven't talked about FADH2 yet. And the other output is just um, molecules that you need to know that come out of the process as well. So remember, two pyruvates, that's the end portion of glycolysis. We go from glucose, six carbons, to two pyruvate molecules with three carbons each. And we also released two waters, which, did I have that on the slide? 
Let me go back. Okay. Oh yeah, two water. Okay. So yeah, it in the payoff, in the energy payoff phase, I forgot to mention that, sorry. Two waters were also given off. So water and carbon dioxide are both just waste products from this, this whole process. Okay. Whew. So now I want to talk briefly about fermentation, and then this will be the last little piece. Um, have you guys heard of fermentation, like the process of fermentation? Do you guys know anything that is fermented? Beer. Beer. Yeah, beer is kind of the most common, commonly fermented food that we eat. Um, sauerkraut is fermented. Kimchi is a really famous fermented kombucha. If you guys drink kombucha, it is a fermented product as well. So what is fermentation? Um, it basically occurs when no oxygen is present. So this goes back to that bullet point I had on one of the earlier slides where glycolysis can happen even if there's no oxygen. The whole process of respiration can't, but that first step of it, the first third, can. And that's called fermentation. If there's no oxygen present, fermentation will proceed rather than the rest of respiration. And um, what happens is essentially glycolysis just keeps going. So we have those three steps of respiration. We're gonna delete steps two and three and glycolysis just keeps happening over and over in a cycle, essentially, when you're fermenting something. No citric acid cycle, no oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so um, I might have this on the next slide, but if you think about glycolysis, we made two ATP, right? Not very many, especially compared to 36, if we went through the whole process of respiration. But in the absence of oxygen, it's better than nothing. Um, so things that can actually do fermentation, that fermentation works with, basically glycolysis happens over and over again, just making two ATP each time. So just a little bit of energy um, with each round of glycolysis. Most of what's happening is that NADH is turned back into NAD plus because we need to uh, basically restore that to be able to keep that cycle going. So we need an NAD plus to attach an electron to, to keep this process going. So that's essentially what fermentation is doing just over and over making tiny little amounts of ATP each time. So in general, there's a couple different kinds of fermentation. So glycolysis proceeds normally, <clears throat> but then at the end, so you still have pyruvate at the end. So here, these are our two different kinds of fermentation. So you have pyruvate, you still get to that point, but then instead of continuing on, if you have lactic acid fermentation, you make lactate, the cell makes lactate. And this is what occurs, um, if you're like exercising really hard, you're running, you're lifting, and your muscles start to burn, and then you're sore afterwards, right? That's because your muscles are going into, they're out of oxygen. They don't have enough oxygen to continue on with regular respiration, so they do lactic acid fermentation. They're making lactic acid. That acid is what's making your muscles kind of burn, and that's what makes you sore the day after, basically a hard workout. So that's lactic acid fermentation. Our muscles do it, hopefully frequently, if we're exercising enough. The other option that makes beer and all the other, um, like kombucha also, I don't know, I guess, uh, I guess sauerkraut goes through this process too, alcohol fermentation. So pyruvate, rather than going on into the Krebs cycle, um, basically turns into ethanol, and ethanol is alcohol. It also releases carbon dioxide, so that's why beer is carbonated. Um, so if you trap that carbon dioxide at a certain point during fermentation, you have a carbonated beverage. Um, if you let it all release, then you don't have a carbonated beverage, like wine or something. Okay, so that is alcohol fermentation. So lactic acid fermentation versus alcohol fermentation. 
And the really important part here, it only makes two ATP instead of 36. By chopping off the process at the end of glycolysis, these things that are doing this are only making two ATP. Okay, that's, that's the beginning part of respiration. Um, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.